Hello, and thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, and for those of you who are watching uh, live, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on which part of the globe you are in. Uh, we are at the Open Source Summit, uh, uh, North America here in Seattle. And today we are going to talk about machine learning pipelines and lineage, right? And specifically on top of Kubernetes, right? We all know Kubernetes as, as the container orchestration platform, but off late, you know, there has been a lot of great work happening in terms of establishing machine learning and MLOps platform on top of Kubernetes, and this talk is going to go into some of the aspects of it. Myself is Animesh Singh. I'm the CTO for Watson AI and Data Open Technology, and leading a lot of engagements in open source from IBM. With me, I have my colleague, Tommy Lee. Tommy, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, my name is Tommy. I'm a senior developer in IBM. Focused on the Kubo project. Yes. Um, so Tommy's part of the team and leading a lot of the number of the initiatives here. So let's move on. Now, one of the things which we are noticing definitely is, you know, enterprises are still struggling to scale AI beyond experimentation. I mean, a lot of times the news come that, you know, I've developed my model. It has been more than uh, 11 months, the model is still not deployed in production. Even if it is deployed, uh, the it's hard to measure the business impact of those deployed models. In some cases, right, there is not trust. Um, the organizations or the end users who are supposed to take action on these deployed models, they don't have trust in these deployed models. So now, one of the things is like, you know, the best practices for building accurate models are well understood. Like how do you go through different parts of the life cycle in terms of producing these models? What is not is essentially, you know, how to create these production data science platforms at scale. Right, you need a holistic architecture. You need model management. You need integration with rest of the uh, enterprise silo systems. You need logging, tracing. Then you know you need more effective engineering, which means you know a lot of automation, a lot of standards, and a lot of pipelines. Right, uh, unless you standardize and automate this whole field, you're not going to be able to scale uh, to the extent you desire. And last but not the least, you need smooth operations. Right, it's one thing to deploy. It's one thing to monitor and manage the day two which is much harder, right? So you need a lot of monitoring around models, around your maintenance strategy, et cetera. So I think we, we understand clearly that, you know, the three pillars of AI lifecycle, right? We have data sets, you use data to build models, which then automate decisions, right? So data and models are the two pillars. And when we look at what is the third one, that essentially is the pipelines, right? You cannot do this breadth oriented a uh, very uh, manual intensive uh, procedure unless you automate and the way to automate is using pipelines, right? Starting from data cleansing, feature engineering, data ing ingestion, all the different fields you go through. And then when you come to the machine learning part of it, when you're running distributed training, you're running hyperparameter optimization, then you are running validation on top of your trained models, finally deploying them. But then, you know, your journey is not stopping there while deploying, right? You need to be monitoring for uh, drift, anomaly, other things, right? So all these things need to be automated and the way to automate this end-to-end -end life cycle is through pipelines. I cannot you know, uh, overstate the relevance of pipelines in this whole ecosystem to actually scale and produce you know, AI models in production at, at a scale which you desire. So for that, uh, one of the projects which became very popular in the industry, uh, open source project is called Qflow Pipelines. Uh, essentially, you know, it's, uh, think of it as a CI-CD pipeline as a very basic level something which can run on Kubernetes. And then, you know, when you run on Kubernetes, each of your tasks can be encapsulated inside containers. At the basic level, that's what it is. But then you start working towards, you know, machine learning capabilities. What are the machine learning capabilities in it? So essentially, you know, there is a Python DSL so that data scientists can actually program this whole pipeline end-to-end -end using Python directly. No need to uh, deal with Kubernetes YAML files, Docker containers. If you just want to use Python, program pipelines, launch it, use it, right? The other part is, you know, there is a lot of capabilities built around lineage and metadata, which I will, you know, go into some of these details, which are very, very important in the machine learning world. So, for example, in this case, like when you see this uh, definition here, uh, this is like a 15 lines of Python code. What, what it is doing is, you know, it's doing TensorFlow data validation, doing pre-processing, then, you know, training, running distributed training using TensorFlow under the covers. Then finally, you know, once your model is produced after training, it's running model analysis and then deploying your model in production. All end-to-end -end data and machine learning lifecycle done through these 15 lines of code. Now, obviously, somebody has before that, you know, 
provided automated, uh, you know, templates for these to be executed. But here now a data scientist can come, program these pipelines and run them, you know, repeatedly at scale. That's the power which Qflow pipeline brings uh, using the Python SDK and makes it very friendly to, for data scientists. Now, when we decided to productize this within Watson and within IBM, uh, one of the things which we did, so Qflow pipeline by default, the architecture essentially is that, you know, it uses Argo, which is a CNCF project, right, uh, as the underlying container orchestration CICD engine. We replaced that whole thing and rewrote the Qflow pipelines to actually run on top of Tekton. Now, Tekton is another uh, project. It's part of the CD Foundation under Linux Foundation, initially started by Google. IBM and Red Hat are prolific contributors, and we have standardized our whole cloud pipeline story around Tekton. That means Red Hat OpenShift pipelines, they are based on Tekton. IBM Cloud pipelines, they are based on Tekton. So it made all the sense for us to build our machine learning and AI strategy and the pipelines on top of you know, Tekton. So we leveraged you know, uh, the Tekton substrate under the covers and rewrote Qflow pipelines to run on top of it. And now you, know, you get all the machine learning capabilities from Qflow, but running on top of Tekton. Right, now if you look at Tekton at a very basic level, essentially you know, it uh, exposes a bunch of Kubernetes custom resources for tasks, pipeline runs, task runs, I wouldn't go into the details of it, but it's suffice to say, think of it like, you know, task is your unit of work, and task is essentially made up of different steps, right? And each task is essentially, you know, running in its own pod. And the combination of all these makes up a pipeline, right? And that's how very modularly architected Tekton is. So now let's talk a bit about machine learning capabilities, right? Uh, what are the machine learning capabilities beyond the Python DSL? Is it just the Python DSL? No, there is a lot of metadata logging which Qflow pipeline provides. Now, what do you, why do you need metadata logging, right? Hey, first of all, you need to find out, right, trace back what data set my model was trained on, what hyperparameter was used, what TensorFlow version was used, because tomorrow if your model is making decisions like denying someone uh, a loan or admitting someone to a university, you will need to have that auditability and tracing, right, and metadata logging provides you that, right? So you can trace back all the way to the data, to the hyperparameters, to the framework version. And then you can compare various, uh, you know, different experiments which you are running, right, to train your models, which one is, uh, you know, uh, performing better on different parameters or which one is running faster, right. Not only this, you, when you are looking at the field of transfer learning, where you get actually some base models and you need to produce more customized industry specific models, you know, metadata logging can help you in that as well. And last but not the least, right, in terms of being able to cache so if you're running these very, very long pipelines which are running distributed training, and you probably, you know, at some step, 30 minutes or two hours down the line, there is a mistake. You don't want to go back all the way and start again. You want to be able to cache and move forward, right, in the next run. So metadata logging also provides that capability. Then there is artifact tracking, right? So as I was talking about the artifact tracking, essentially here is all the artifacts which are produced, whether it's the next version of the data set or the model which is produced, all these things are logged as different artifacts under Qflow pipelines, and you can go, and they're all versioned, you know, nicely, and you can look at the history. And then, you know, combine this, all these different artifact tracking and the pipeline runs, and you get lineage tracking, which essentially allows you to go all the way, you know, back from your produced model. If you can see the model is here, but you can trace back all the way, you know, from the model, you know, how was the data set transformed, what was the initial data set, so you can trace back everything all the way to the back using this lineage tracking capability. And to enable this metadata and lineage tracking, one of the, cap uh, one of the things which uh, Qflow pipeline uh, on Tekton uses is essentially what is called metadata writer, which is watching all these different pods which are you know, producing these different outputs onto these empty directory volumes, and then you know, it's watching and copying them back to machine learning uh, MLMD, which is an open source metadata tracking uh, system which was launched by Google. So this is the solution, right, which it helps us track all the metadata as part of the Qflow pipelines. Right, and once it is running, it's all seamless, right? What you see is, you know, as the pipelines are running, you see all the logs getting produced in real time. Uh, if anything is going right or wrong, you can see all this. And then, you know, you can look at the MLM metadata from this tab, and you can launch the different artifacts. And from those artifacts, then you can do the lineage tracing, where you can trace back the lineage from the model deployed from the scoring endpoint all the way back to the data on which the model was trained, right? 
Now, this is all open source, right? And, and on top of this open source, we launched our product called Watson Studio Pipeline. So if you're not aware of Watson, Watson is the IBM's machine learning and AI umbrella. All the platform products which we launch under the AI space come under the Watson branding. So Watson Studio Pipelines essentially was just launched in open beta and it's part of this uh, ecosystem of uh, MLOps portfolio of uh, offerings which we are launching under the Watson brand. And that essentially gives you a lot more capabilities on top of that open source solution, right? Obviously provides the capabilities which are there, but then gives you a drag and drop interface, right? So you can drag and drop different components and construct your pipelines if you don't want to write Python, right? For example. So this caters also towards business users. And then there are components, right, for all the different uh, IBM products like, you know, data refinery, which is our tool for data manipulation, auto AI, which launches auto AI experiments. So a lot of these pre-built components are provided for you to be able to drag and drop onto this palette, construct a nice pipeline and launch it. Now, as you can see on this particular screen, right, this one is using auto AI. It's using data stage. Now, data stage is an IBM product, which you'll be surprised it has been uh, deployed at more than 2,000 plus customers for the last two decades. It's very, very popular uh, pro product in the ETL space. Now with the power of Qflow pipelines and Watson Studio pipelines, you can just drag and drop that, uh, that particular product capability onto this canvas and string it with other capabilities from Watson Umbrella. Okay, so uh, uh, what, do we, what did we talk about so far, right? We talked about that we need pipelines to heavily automate machine learning and AI and move machine learning models in production. For that, the project which we talked about is Qflow Pipelines, and we have a special flavor of Qflow Pipelines, which is built on top of Tekton. Qflow Pipelines on Tekton is our machine learning and AI pipeline engine. That's in open source. And on top of that, we have launched Watson, which is Watson Studio Pipelines, which is the product version. Now, there is one more thing, right, which still uh, doesn't exist, right? What doesn't exist? So one of the things which we are seeing, you know, across enterprises is that there are different groups within uh, companies which are getting formed which are focused on different parts of the AI life cycle, right? So some teams are doing feature engineering, some teams are producing data sets and different versions of the data sets. Some teams are producing models. And then, you know, there are teams which are producing pipelines and individual steps of these pipelines. What is happening is a lot of duplication. You know, sometimes, you know, an organization A within the same company, even smaller companies, they are producing, you know, very similar versions of the data sets, which they have modified, or, you know, very similar versions of the models. Obviously, a lot of the pipelines and the pipeline steps we are seeing, you know, getting duplicated a lot, right? So there is a need for this one central place where you can actually essentially go share what you are building within your organization so that it can be shared across team and organizational boundaries, not within your organization only, right? It can probably be shared across, right? And then the other part is, you know, when you are picking up, for example, you want to pick up a data set or a model from the public repositories, you want to be assured of the licensing, right? You don't want to pick up something and train your model on a particular data set where someone some and sues you, hey, uh, this is not uh, the right data set or you don't know the lineage of that data set. Where did it originate? What was the licensing? What is the auditability trail? So you want to be able to go to that one single certified place where you can uh, you know, download assets uh, where you have the right set of metadata and lineage. Now to handle this problem, we are joining hands with Linux Foundation AI and data and we are announcing a machine learning exchange. So machine learning exchange essentially is built around the concept of sharing and reusing pipelines, data sets, models, notebooks, pipeline components. And this is a project which we are launching jointly with Linux Foundation AI and data on their infrastructure. And we are hoping you know, more and more partners will join uh, on this mission, right? So essentially, as I mentioned, right, you can have, uh, this is one single central place to go you can hit ml-exchange.org right now. Go there and you will see, you know, certified data sets, all with, you know, CDLA license, uh, pipelines, notebooks, and models, which essentially, you know, you can start downloading and using, right, with the right provenance. Now, under the covers, why is it relevant in a pipelines talk? Okay, because under the covers, um, you know, the components which it is using, apart from, you know, sharing a lot of the Qflow pipelines and components, it's using the Qflow pipelines on Tekton engine for executing all these artifacts. So it's not only an engine where you can go share, download, or upload. You can essentially also execute. So if you deploy your own version of machine learning exchange on your Kubernetes cluster, 
then you know you can upload your own assets and you can actually launch them. So the pipelines which are there, hey, you should be able to try it out. Yes, you will be able to launch. The models which are there, you should be able to deploy it. Yes, you would be able to deploy it right there on that particular engine. Right, so that's the inbuilt uh, and, and uh, the integrated capability which machine learning exchange comes with, with Qflow pipelines on Tekton as a pipeline technology, as well as you know another project called KF Serving, or KSER, right, for serving your models in production, right. So it's pre-integrated and pre-built into this. So as I mentioned, like one single place to go, look at your pipelines. Uh, if you're running your own version, you can register, search for pipelines, or you can you know register or upload your own pipelines. And not only that, you should be able to launch your own pipelines as well, right, with the pre-integrated engine in this. So as you can see, when you click the launch button, it comes with all the different input parameters which you can enter and run it. So once it launches, as you can see, you know, it's using the underlying Qflow pipelines on Tekton engine. Similarly with components, right? So uh, Components themselves are the individual building blocks of the pipelines, right? This gives you one central place where you can upload and share all the components and you can try them out before you integrate them in a pipeline, right? A component can be as simple as, hey, echo a hello world, right? In, uh, but then, you know, once it is there, nobody else in your organization should be creating echo hello world, right? I mean, that's the idea. And then you should be able to test it out as well before you start using it as part of the pipelines. Models, definitely, right, they are at the heart and at the center of this, you can go and a lot of the models, uh, we had a sister project called Mach uh, Model Asset Exchange. A lot of the models initially come from there. We are also integrating a lot of the ecosystem models, but models around, you know, uh, object detection, text sentiment classifier, you name it, they're all present there and you should be able to download and use them, right? And if you're running your own version, you should be able to upload your own models and register and expose. And data sets, right? One of, the, uh, as you can see, like the proliferation of data sets within the industry, and they are at the very beginning of the machine learning life cycle. You need different data sets to be able to, you know, train and create, you know, more refined models. So you can actually go look at a data set, look at the metadata surrounding that data set, the licensing, and then you know you can essentially use the pre-built capability within machine learning exchange to download that data set onto your Kubernetes cluster or OpenShift cluster, or you know you can take that data set and run it somewhere else, right? So now, so that's the machine learning exchange framework. And in the catalog, as I was talking about, you know, there is a lot of high quality curated content, right? And, and just to give you a sample of the kind of content which we have in machine learning exchange, for example, you know, one of the uh, data sets which we have, it's the uh, data for, you know, code. Essentially think of it, it's, it's, it's you know, AI for codes, ImageNet, uh, equivalent, right, which allows you to do different kinds of code analysis. It allows you to find duplicate code. It gives you suggestions how to make, uh, make your code performant. So a huge uh, data set. In fact, the largest AI for code open source data set, which is right now available, extends as part of the machine learning exchange, right? And if you want to see the, the breadth of it, it's like 14 million code samples with around half a billion lines of code. Right, that's the, the amount of um, uh, code uh, which is available as in the AI for code data set. And this particular data set is available as part of machine learning exchange, right? And not only this data set, right? You have this data set, but you also have, you know, subset of these data sets for a specific task. Because as we talked about, right, the data set is humongous. You also have associated notebooks, right? Uh, for example, in this case, you see a notebook here for project coordinate language classification, right? These notebooks essentially allow you to take that largest AI for code data set, and then, you know, create more sophisticated models, et cetera, run training. So all in single place, all these related assets. So please give it a try, uh, ml-exchange.org, very easy to hit, and once you go there, it will redirect you. I mean, not redirect, but you have a link there uh, to the GitHub as well. Uh, please go to the GitHub repository, try it out, and, and give us your feedback. Okay, with that, I'll pass on to Tommy uh, to actually uh, talk about some of the advanced Qflow pipelines and Tekton capability and also show you some demos. Tommy? Hi. Thanks, Animesh. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Tommy. So now I'm going to talk about some of the advanced Qflow pipeline and Tekton capabilities. So as we first implement uh, Qflow pipeline on top of the Tekton engine, we realized a lot of the advanced Qflow pipeline features such as like parallel loops and recursion cannot be done with the native uh, Tekton capability right now. 
So this is why we talk to the Tecton communities and we have come up with this new concept called Tecton Custom Tasks. Tecton Custom Tasks are a Tecton feature that you could use to plug in alternative execution engine into existing uh, Tecton pipelines. And they are actually processed in a separate controller, so users could actually define their own uh, reconcile logic that's much differently than the regular Tecton task. Uh, just for some background, regular Tecton task uh, is created with like, a new part to run this code, so it's actually always containerized, whereas in custom tasks, you actually could optimize like commonly used workload inside the controller itself without creating any extra part uh, inside the same cluster. And furthermore, you could also add more like complex execution flows such as loop and recursion on top of your like reconcile logics. And in Q4 pipeline in, uh, with Tecton, we actually uh, make custom tasks a pluggable pipeline component, just as other like Q4 pipeline components you could use um, within the Python DSL. So now I want to go over some of the uh, feature timeline within uh, Tecton custom tasks because it's been a long journey on uh, this new feature on, in Tecton. So when we actually first talked to the community, they introduced this custom task feature back in June 2020. That's when they asked the proposal and introduced the new uh, Run API in, back in July 2020. However, in, at the time, like, the Run API cannot be run inside a um, Tecton pipeline API. So this is why our IBM team kind of stepped in and tried to contribute it and make it closer as like, um, the regular Tecton task API. So we have introduced um, like custom task API inside the pipelines uh, back in uh, December 2020 and add like, additional capabilities such as um, like supporting workspace, service account, part templates uh, early this year and uh, custom task result uh, in February 2021. And recently in the past few months, we also like try to fill in like more gaps in like uh, the task spec feature. Um, so we actually introduced like um, embedded uh, task spec for custom tasks uh, back in June and also uh, we have supported the timeout API just last month. And at the time, we actually try to fulfill like, the rest of the API gap from our custom tasks uh, at the moment with the communities. And we have the uh, proposal accepted as well um, back in um, last month. So now I want to introduce uh, one of the main custom tasks we have created for Q4 Pipeline in Tecton to fulfill some of the uh, core missing feature in Q4 Pipelines. So one of the core features we want to fulfill in like, um, k pipeline is able to loop and recursively uh, run a same subset of the pipeline over and over. So this is why we introduced this uh, new custom task in Tecton called Pipeline Runs, where the main feature is able to like, typically loop over a set of parameters. And additionally, it could also loop into multiple arguments inside a uh, list of like, JSON arguments as well. And last week, we also handles like, conditions, so it could actually run uh, loops recursionally. And in this custom task, our main goal is first be able to like support like loops on a subset of pipelines, so it could handle like the Gifford pipeline in Tecton DSL, such as like uh, parallel loops. And second of all, we want to be able to create uh, sub pipelines, which is equivalent to Gifford pipelines uh, graph components in this case. And uh, the third thing we want to support like recursive reference, so we could actually create like while loops using like recursion um, loop inside the DSL. And we also have support for parallelism, which is also like a feature existing in the uh, Gifford pipelines as well, where you could limit the number of uh, parallel gra uh, running graph um, within the same parallel loops. And last, we, are, we are also have the uh, uh, capabilities to optimize like, some of the retry and timeout strategies. So let's say if one of the uh, parameter in the loop is failed, you don't have to retry every uh, parameter in the loop over when you enable the uh, optimized retry strategies. And furthermore, um, more than the uh, looping components, we actually have introduced other Tecton custom tasks to optimize our workloads um, in Kifa Pipeline as well. And one of the um, examples we have introduced is the uh, custom expression language, which you could actually process much complex condition just inside the controller without creating any um, new parts. So it actually optimizes a lot for the uh, container runtimes. And then uh, and another example is able to like, uh, for commonly used tasks such as just sending notifications could be also just done inside the controller without um, having create a new task every, for every pipeline when you just want to send a notification to like, one of your users or one of your organizations. And then last we also introduced like, some of the new components um, in um, KP uh, Protectant. Uh, one of the components we introduced is called any sequencer. 
So any sequential, um, in short, is a dependent task that actually starts when any of the task or condition dependency completely success completed successfully. So that pattern actually doesn't have to wait for all the um, task dependence to be complete before moving to the next steps. And uh, this can also like depends on like conditions. So um, let's say in this case, you have job one, job two, and job three. When job one completes, any synchronous circle actually just trigger job four directly. Or when you, you have job three completes, you could actually verify if job three complete in a certain way before you trigger like um, the condition for running job four. So it's actually like, um, with flexible dependencies um, to run on KVP in that counts. And I will go to show like one of the um, demos on how this actually work in action um, right now. So I will go over like uh, the demo for running um, the any sequencer on um, Kipflow's uh, pipelines. So let me bring up the example over here. So we have uh, uploaded a pipeline um, that is uh, running any sequencer. So any sequencer in, in the base form is just a regular Kipflow pipeline components where you could actually um, just depend on like, three other different tasks. And then uh, those, those tasks, uh, when one of those tasks actually completes, then the any um, test uh, sequencer task could actually just uh, seize it and actually trigger the next components. So, let me start to run um, these examples uh, so you can see in actions. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, give me one second. Wait. Thank you very much. Um, yes. So we just execute like the uh, any sequence of pipeline. So let's take a look. So to begin with, um, the any sequence of pipeline will have three components. That these are just sleep components, as you can see. Uh, they actually sleep, sleep for like different uh, section of the times. So one of them actually sleep for 15 seconds, and the other one sleep for 200, and this one sleep for 300. So when this uh, task complete, we actually run a new task called flip coin. So we flip a coin to say whether the result is head or tail. Um, so let's take a look at the uh, result of this. So because this actually say is tails, so the any a test component actually see is like not um, expected because the any test component expect a head condition before it actually trigger the next drops. So when you actually look in the logs for the any sequencer, um, you could see okay the flip coin component is complete. However, like the condition didn't met um, as 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 the expected outcome. So it actually um, not going to start um, the next components. It will just continue to wait for either uh, the slip component two or component three to be complete in order to proceed to the next task. Um, I also have like a previous run where um, it actually returns um, head. So let me go on uh, this one. Oh, sorry, um, actually this one. So in this one, because the uh, component actually returns head as input, um, so you could see it, so that's why it says the uh, task run of uh, flip coins as seed and continues the next task where it runs the um, job for slip components. So in short, this is how like uh, any sequential work in actions. Um, because um, So now we're going to like talk about uh, some of the um, other demo we have prepared. Uh, one of them is actually what Animesh had mentioned about. Uh, we have a managed service on IBM Cloud to run uh, Kipfer pipeline uh, in Tectons. Um, so what we have called is the uh, Watson Studio Pipelines. So for Watson Studio Pipeline, you could actually create um, this on any um, IBM Cloud um, Watson Studio service. So when you go to uh, Watson Studio Projects, uh, you could click on Add to Projects. So you will see like a pipeline uh, managed service. When you add this in, you actually will see one of the pipelines we have created here um, for the demo. This is what we call um, Auto AI pipeline to actually um, pull like data sets um, and autoly, automatically uh, tune the hyperparameters and then find the best result of the pipelines and um, deploy them on Watson Studio. So you could actually use it in actions. So when, once you get into like the Watson Studio pipelines, um, you will see uh, it's a little bit different from uh, the Kipfer pipeline dashboard where. Um, in, in Watson Studio Public, you actually have the ability to drag and drop different components, as you can see over here, and like create new dependencies. 
And then you could also uh, simply just remove them if you, you don't want to. And when you double click it, you could always like, modify like the different input output parameters. And one of the cool features we found is like, um, uh, having the ability to able to add annotation and comments actually helps data science to understand what the, this components actually try to do. Like when they, when they see it in the um, um, UX of a, a dashboard. So this is why we find it very helpful. And once we um, like prepared the pipeline um, well with all the parameters, then we could actually click on run and um, start running these pipelines to um, so select the data sets, and then we will select as um, a Boston Studio uh, space to deploy our models. So at the end, we could actually uh, go on um, the Boston Studio space to, to run the predictions. And then we auto fill the API key for your uh, relevant services that you use in these pipelines. So once we click on runs, um, it, it behind the scene will create like a pipeline for you on a Kubernetes clusters, and then we will run this um, step by steps, uh, just like the Q4 pipelines um, for open source. So because this pipeline will take like several minutes to actually like get the data set and train the models, so I will just show you uh, what the uh, pipeline we have previous run. Um, so in this case, you can see all the pipelines has been um, complete, and you can also check the logs once the pipeline is finished. And you can also uh, click on here what, with the uh, pipeline outputs where you can see all the um, output for each component and a, on a one page view, which is very nice. You can actually keep track of it without actually like click on uh, each component. And once the pipeline is complete, you could still like add it, like the annotation part. Whereas, okay, if this pipeline is failed, you could like let's say like modify the annotation a little bit, just let the data science know, okay, what is going wrong, and um, the when, when the next data science take a look at this pipeline, they have some idea uh, how to keep track of stuff um, for each uh, component in, inside these pipelines. So this is like an overview of uh, what uh, Watson Studio Pipeline looks like. Um, and last but not least, we are going to just show you a brief view of uh, uh, the new open source project we've introduced called um, Machine Learning Exchange. So in this case, uh, this Machine Learning Exchange is actually running our, one of our Kubernetes clusters that could execute um, uh, pipelines um, on this. So actually, let me enlarge it so people could see it better. And in this case, we have like several different kind of uh, assets. So one of them is data sets. Uh, as Animesh mentioned, uh, one of the cool data sets we have is called like Project CoNet, where you actually have uh, 40 million code samples. And we click on this data set, it actually shows you like, all the um, information about this data set, what kind of license you have used. And you want to just have a more short view of like um, the, um, the data set metadata itself, you could see it in the YAMLs. And of course, you could also launch this data sets on the same cluster, so it actually create a volume and uh, provide a um, data set that's ready to use for your other assets such as pipeline and notebooks. So once the data set is ready, you actually could like, actually run a notebook to use this, this data set. So let's say we pick like, a data set for the project code net, uh, let's say for language classifications. Um, this notebook uses the subset of the um, code net data sets. Um, where, of course, you could actually run, launch it directly over here, but uh, you could also preview this notebook code um, to see what this notebook is try actually trying to do. So this notebook um, will first just try to import um, a list of libraries and then process the data set. And then this is a classification model, so you could see this is like the list of um, classes we're going to like classify. Um, so because we're only running a subset of the code net, so we only have like um, this 10 different um, classification class um, in these models. So because um, we're in, um, we don't have that much time to run over this whole notebook, we actually pre-trained these models uh, beforehand and register as a, a model asset already. So in this case, we pre-trained the uh, language classification models um, on machine learning exchange and register as a model assets over here. So inside the model assets, you can also like provide a readme to describe, okay, how this model is being trained, what kind of data is being used. Um, and of course, you can also like generate samples, uh, give a public code to run it in the background or run it on your own, give a public instance. 
So uh, because it actually integrate with the Q4 pipeline, we have uh, built in um, inside machine learning exchange. So we actually could just launch it directly over here. Um, so in this case, we're just going to launch this model inside uh, a Kubernetes clusters um, with a simple deployment and services. Um, to launch it, it's very simple. So you just have to provide uh, what kind of action you want to do. Uh, in this case, just serving uh, on a Kubernetes platforms. And we'll predefine the run name for you. So you just simply click on uh, submit. Behind the scene, we, are, we would create a Q4 pipeline um, with the in integrated um, platforms. And uh, we're in there, like you can see, they actually create a um, pipeline behind the scene. First, it uh, extract the config from the machine learning exchange model and translate it into something that Kubernetes could understand. And once you see it, um, this is done, uh, it will create a, a separate um, component that actually take the um, uh, deployment uh, from Kubernetes and actually deploy on the same cluster so the user could actually navigate and try out these models. So I um, believe the Wi-Fi is a little bit slow, but once um, the model is complete, you should be able to see Inside the logs, um, the model is being deployed, and this is like the um, uh, endpoint that uh, this model will it host. It could just directly click on this endpoint, um, and because this model is already wrapped up with a Swagger APIs, um, so you could actually just directly using um, a, a simple post request with the built-in Swagger. And in this case, we will just do a simple model prediction. So when you actually try out these models. Um, you could just upload any um, coding files. Uh, I will just pick a Python file, let's say in this case. And then we just execute, then you could see, okay, this deployment models actually give me a result uh, of, okay, this file is like written in Python with uh, 0.73 uh, confident rate. Of course, this is uh, training with like a subset of the code net um, data sets. So that's why the confident rate might not be that appealing, but of course, but as you like train with more models and more sophisticated um, algorithm, like this um, confidence rate could be improved and um, more suitable for your use case. And uh, this is the end of our, our demos. Um, thank you very much. And please uh, check out our other talks um, we have over the uh, Open Source Summit as well. And um, one of the Talk we want to highlight is tomorrow morning we have the keynote with uh, Todd Moore, our VPs, to talk about more in details on how advanced uh, data AI quantum using open source. And we'll also introduce like um, machine learning exchange in more detail over there. Thank you very much for watching. Um, is there any question online or in person? Is there any question in person, or um, do you see any question online? Um, just, just wondering. Yes, go ahead. Uh, the Tecton custom tasks, are they available outside uh, uh, Qflow? Or so they are available in general? Um, so, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the uh, Tecton custom tasks, um, uh, the question is about like is the custom uh, custom tasks outside of Qflow, right? Um, so right now um, there's two uh, Tecton custom tasks uh, we actually bring in as uh, public Qflow pipeline in Tecton. One is the pipeline root is actually integrated as part of it. Another one is the common expression language that's also integrated as part of the uh, Qflow um, library we have. Uh, however, like for other custom tasks, we actually make it pluggable, so you actually could go to the type of communities. If you build any new custom tasks, you could just plug in um, just like how you build like other Qflow pattern components. You just find that uh, custom task, um, just, just map the uh, parameter into like uh, what Qflow pattern component YAML could understand, and you could just run it on top of Qflow pipeline with Tecton. That's how we actually working right now. Right, thank you very much. Is there other question? Okay, if not, thanks everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>